and because yeah. there are more than just 100 uh, uh we will the rest will join on youtube uh, okay sure live sure. yeah and it's sure. starting any minute now sure. okay so whenever you're ready maybe in a minute you can start yes. okay thank you yeah uh, of course i'll introduce yourself so just give me a minute okay <laughs> okay all right so good morning everybody uh welcome to the first meter researcher uh, series uh, and we're very happy to have dr suri with us here today um dr suri has uh, joined tifr last year in 2020 uh, she completed her uh, doctoral program from bits pilani goa campus uh, she's a physicist by training uh, she spent a few years at the massachusetts institute of technology in the usa um and uh, uh now is uh, in the material science uh, and the condensed matter sorry physics lab at uh, uh, at tifr so uh, over to you tavla and uh, i hope uh, the students have um, some questions for you and uh, uh, can spend the next hour interacting uh, with you thank you hi so can you hear me yes you're audible okay So first of all uh, thanks to Chandrika and the outreach uh, our team for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk and interact with uh, school students it's really a great pleasure um so yeah so today i'll be talking about something uh, uh, the physics of things that we already have in our hands uh, all the time uh gadgets like uh, even this zoom call you have one or the other gadget of, of mobile phone a laptop uh i mean the list is endless and uh have you sort of ever wondered how does it work okay and let me tell you one thing you we drop our mobile phones often on the floor and you just pick it up and it works just as well you know and that's really not a coincidence or a magic there is a lot of science and engineering that has gone behind making these products to make it that robust and today let us sort of have a trip into this journey and i'll share with you what is it that we do in our lab uh, which eventually has dreams of fulfilling technological prospects like our gadgets okay and uh, to be clear what we do is a very laboratory level physics and we don't really make any gadgets directly so we will try to understand what is the fundamental concept behind these uh, uh, technological devices and so on okay so the first thing uh, okay uh, the first thing uh, first question that comes is what is it how do these gadgets process information or let's say you say hello i'm speaking now and the information is getting transmitted all across you know from the phone the internet satellite back to the gadget and so on so how does a gadget understand what i say turns out okay that all the information that we give into a gadget has to be in terms of ones and zeros so the so every processor understands only these two numbers 101010 so whatever you say has to be encoded in form of ones and zeros for example hello can be encoded you know the h stands for a set of eight you know a string of eight numbers or bits 0110 so on and each num each letter is coded into one and zero so finally for a computer you are basically saying this number you know this long number that's what the computer understands well okay 
uh, that's that sounds uh, quite exciting. Now, how does computer even get this information of one and zero? It's very simple. You can call this number zero as an off state or you know a light bulb which is off. It's zero, and if it's on, it's one. A light bulb can only take two states, right? A, a good light bulb, either it's on or off. So now the question is, okay, if the computer understands ones and zeros, and if light bulbs are the ones which you know give it ones and zeros, does my computer, you know, or a mobile phone inside have a light bulb? That's not the LED light in your phone, but are there so many light bulbs inside your thing? So that's the question we would ask. And not really. Um, instead of a light bulb one and zero, there is a simple device called a transistor or a field effect transistor. This was a Nobel Prize discovery in 1956, and it was uh, discovered by these three gentlemen here. And they made this is exact. This is actually the device made by themselves. They made something which looked like this, which is called a transistor, and it gives you two states always, ones and zeros. You can pass current through it and always control whether it is in a state one or state zero. Okay, so if you have a lot of transistors inside your gadget, you can code one and zero, and thus you can pass a message called hello by having so many transistors in your gadget. Okay, now first thing is look this is so big this is in fact bigger than my mobile phone itself so if i have to encode a word hello into my phone do i have to you know my computer will have to be as so big and in fact it was so big this is a picture i took of uh, of the world's first calculator okay all of you have such tiny calculators in your uh, uh, with you, but the world's first calculator looked this big. It had registers, and the way you fed into you fed information into it. If you want to do two plus two, you know the card you see here with holes and things. You had to write what you want to do in this and feed it into this system here, and it would go all the way do some calculation here and give you an output after two days. Okay, it was that really that huge. And this is one of the world's initial computers. And you can see these women programmers who are amazing scientists of uh, the days when computers really began. And this was a CPU. You know, you don't even see a CPU in your laptop. It's, it's so tiny. But this is how huge it was. And all of it was so huge because the transistors or the vacuum tubes, all these are I mean, these building blocks of the um, CPUs were that huge. That was the reason uh, of such complex uh, of dimensions of these gadgets. So what is this woman doing here? What is she trying to do? She's trying to process information. She's trying to plug some wires into this. You know? So, all right, so it's fine that you can put information like ones and zeros. How do you actually do an operation? Let us say I want to get an answer for one plus one. What is one plus one? It's two. So I want to get an answer for this. How does uh, a computer do this? So the computer understands only one and zero. So if even if you say one, there is a way in which the number one is written in, in the binary form. This writing in terms of two numbers, zero and one is called binary. Okay. So if you see here, there is a bulb here which is on and it is off. So if you connect these two together, there is a wire going into this first bulb and the same wire continues into the second bulb and then it goes forward. But because this is off, you know, there is no current that can pass through this because this is off. So the whole, the net result of this is an off state, which is zero. But if I have both of them on, the current simply flows and it is on. So if you connect uh, in the bulbs in this fashion, one after the other, placed like this, then you can actually write it like this. This is the way the computer writes it for you. Don't have to, don't worry about how it's written, but this is the way computer understands. But there is another way in which a computer can understand, which is like this. Instead of connecting it one after the other like this, I take a wire out from here and put it here, okay? This is on, this is off. Okay, this is off, but current doesn't flow here. It is fine, but it can still flow here, right? So here also, this is one and zero, a combination, but the output is still one. 
So it is zero only if both of them are zero. It will not find a way. So you know these are the ways in which computer understands playing with one and zero. So this is this these are called logical operations. Okay, the computer logical op the logical op operations in which a computer works. But uh, don't worry if you don't really uh, you know understand what exactly is happening. All you need to understand is understand is that there are two states zero and one. And you can perform operations of addition, multiplication, and so on, but everything has to be in terms of zero and one, and that's how it understands. Well, now the question is the most important question is: Okay, there is a transistor which does all these operations, it gives you the states zero and one, and you can perform operations all well and good. How did we arrive from here into here? You know, this is a microprocessor, and what your mobile phone contains inside. Please don't break your mobile phones and check for it, but. Uh, this is how it looks like. You can actually Google search and look for an image instead. And uh, this is so tiny. This is like one centimeter square. That's it. And this has millions and billions of transistors and does all things for you. How did we reach from here to here? And what is the technology? And what what sort of research has gone into uh, you know evolution from here to here? That's what we will try to understand here. So the technology has advanced in many ways. Miniaturization is nothing but making things smaller and smaller. You know, one transistor takes so much size, whereas here there are millions and billions of transistors. And how did that happen? That's called miniaturization, making things smaller and smaller. And it's not just enough if you make smaller, all of them have to behave. If I have two mobile phones of same company, same brand, you know, Samsung Galaxy A7, if you and your friend have, they cannot function differently. They have to be the same. So, so in, when you when a company makes millions of mobile phones, but all of them have to function the same way. So in large scale, how do you maintain the content consistency? And what sort of programs or logic do you, like I showed you 0, 1, 0, 1. So how do you actually write these programs such that the efficiency is really maintained in throughout the, throughout the program? You wouldn't want to write the same code over and over again. And then there's a language that develops aimed purely to address these things. And then the speed, you don't want to, you know, uh, press H and then, you know, wait for two hours and then it appears. You want it to be quick. If I lose connection now for a moment, then we all are going to freak out. So it has to be fast. It has to be small. It has to be this. It has to be that, you know, it better write the exams for us and get us first rank. We really want everything out of it. So, well, so how have we reached so far? And I'll address these aspects of uh, the whole uh, physics level research aspects of these things. One is something called the thin film technology. And this basically addresses how do you shrink the materials to so thin and small dimensions. Second, what materials do you use? Do you use just about anything? Can I take a piece of wood and you know make it into a transistor? Can I take, uh, you know, something like ice in the fridge and make it a transistor. What sort of materials do really matter in this thing? And then, okay, you sh shrink it down, but then the transistor has wires, electrodes coming out of it, no? How do you actually make the wires? Like, you know, you see here, there's so many pins and if you watch carefully, there are wires going. These are all wires printed. So how does that happen? And then once you do all this, how do you actually know it works, okay? All these things we will we will answer all this uh, answer to all of this one by one and then finally I will tell you why are we doing all this okay and where are we heading and future prospects and perhaps a few things which you as kids would one day make a big revolution in this technology okay all these uh, things we will try to discuss first simple technology, simple technology okay how is it done there is there are many ways in which this can be done I'll tell you just one way. What you're seeing here in this picture is, you know, there's a person holding tweezers and this is, these pieces are nothing but silicon substrates. They're as flat as they can be. They're really super flat uh, chips, silicon chips, just silicon wafers, okay? What people do in molecular beam epitaxy system is they take this silicon wafer and the jargon for this is substrate. Substrate is nothing but a plate or wherever you want to put your film, that's, that's it, it holds the film that you want to put. And it's sent into a system that looks like this, a pump, you know, this is a ultra high vacuum chamber. What do you mean by ultra high vacuum? You know, 
there is a chamber or there is a box and you really want to get all the air inside it out as i told you these 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 systems are all really very thin when you want to grow very thin material it has to be super clean because if there is dust and you want to grow something thin on it when the dust is going to spoil spoil your thin film you don't want any dust there so you have to remove all the air inside this chamber and that's how you evacuate you you use something called pump okay you keep on pumping until all the dust is gone and the more dust you remove from inside more air you remove from inside better is the vacuum so you have a really high vacuum it's called an ultra high vacuum chamber and then whatever material you want to deposit on this uh, substrate you put it in something called a k cell or it's just a heater you put the material in and you warm up the material you go on heating it okay what happens when you heat water for example okay i don't want to deposit water but i'm just giving you an example you keep on heating what water it evaporates right so if i want to heat some material like gold aluminum i just go on heating it heating it until it evaporates and when it evaporates and it goes and hits this substrate there is a thin film of that of that material that deposits here that's what a molecular epitaxis beam epitaxis system does by that you can actually get atomically thin you know just one atom of any material that you want you can grow atom by atom and a realistic system looks like this this is a ultra high vacuum chamber and these holes you see here are called view ports where you can actually see what is happening inside and this is another ultra high vacuum chamber and both of these are connected once you put your substrate in here there are ways where you can maneuver the substrate into this chamber and you know do all kinds of thing and actually at the bottom there are pumps there are cases where you heat things and so on so this is how this is one way of actually making these materials very thin atomically thin and is that all i mean you know there is that only there are many 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 ways i'm just due to you know shortage of time i cannot address everything i'll show you another interesting thing which you have already done okay you are you have already seen this it's called graphene if you have used the pencil you have already come across graphene okay what is this graphene all about this graphene is nothing but one monolayer of carbon atoms which are arranged in this hexagonal fashion like this okay and your and how is it extra extracted from graphite and your pencil lead is nothing but graphite so how did they actually uh you know this this picture here so light this is one monolayer of carbon atoms arranged in hexagonal fashion and there is there is a reason why it looks so uh, you know light and in that particular violet color and this for for just exfoliating one monolayer of carbon atom it was given a nobel prize i tell you why so first let us uh see Uh, how how do you actually make graphene? And this is exactly already you can even do it in your school or something. So this is a scotch tape, okay? Scotch tape, gum tape, glue tape, whatever. And then she is taking the tweezers. These are metallic tweezers, and these are graphite flakes. This is these graphite crystals are how are from what your pencil leads are made. So she is putting them on this uh, tape, okay? Okay. now see what she does she just presses this uh, scotch tape against it and then is pressing it and then very gently she is pulling it apart okay and then she goes on repeating this in many places of this scotch tape in different ways. so you see she is increasing so she is thinning down the graphite and when she thins down you see there is so much thin graphite here all right now i want one monolayer how do i get one monolayer so this is she is taking a silicon substrate and on top of that she placed her master tape or the tape in which there is a lot of graphite crystal and she is rubbing on this right and now very gently she is just taking off the tape now as she pulls this apart this monolayers of graphene and few layers of graphene get left out on the substrate and that's how you see you put the microscope you see these small pieces here this is nothing but graphene or oh, she got graphene just by doing this and this super light the lightest one is monolayer graphene the dark ones are bilayer trilayer and many layers of graphene this you see here lightest one here this is monolayer graphene and for doing this these two people got a nobel prize wow that seems really very simple to get a nobel prize 
Let's see why. Okay. Uh, well, so graphene really is interesting, not because it's as simple as that to obtain it. That's that's a big, big advantage. Along with that, graphene has amazing properties. It's transparent. It's really, it's just because you see here, this is a plastic sheet on which graphene has been uh, printed and there are electrodes printed on this and you can actually make flexible transistors out of this. So in future, you can actually get a mobile phone which you can just fold and put it into your pocket like a handkerchief. So, and it has amazing conductivity, electrical, like thermal, and the electrons in this uh, graphene move really fast. So you can actually make high-speed devices and so on. There are so many wonder, wonderful properties of graphene because of which uh, it really got a Nobel Prize, okay? Now, fine, you saw two things. One is by evaporation in ultra high vacuum, you can make materials. Another is you can also exfoliate and make materials. There are many more ways and uh, let us stick to this and see that, okay, these are two ways in which you can get thin materials. Fine, now, okay, you got a very thin material. How do you actually make a device out of it? Or, you know, those electrodes, electrical wires, how do I pull out wires? Because now it's one monolayer thin. You put wire on it, it will break and you're done. So how do you do this? This is called lithography. And most of us have already seen this. All of us. Maybe. If you have done a rangoli, you have done it. So there is something called a stencil mask, right? You, all of you have a scale where ABCD letters are written. It's a stencil on which you paint something or you draw. And then you remove the stencil, you get whatever you wanted done. That's how you do the uh, drawing using stencil, right? So... Now here we are talking about atomic, monoatomic, you know, layer thick materials and thin films. And it is done using something called E-beam lithography. What is E-beam? E means electron beam or even photolight, a light, laser, ultraviolet light. Light or electron beam is sufficient. So first thing is we need to make wires which touch the monolayer or very, very thin devices and small devices. And because of this, they have to be very, very small, like hundreds of nanometers. It's thousand times smaller than your hair. You need that dimension of device for which you take the substrate or wherever you want to draw a pattern. And then you spin coat it with something called a resist or a photo resist. Okay. Now I'm telling you how to make this mask, stencil mask for a small device. And then wherever you want the wires, you expose that with the electron beam. The advantage of electron beam is that the dimension of electron beam can be as, as small as 100 nanometers or atomic, you know, comparable to atomic layer uh, uh, dimensions because of which you can get that small pattern. And then you can just develop it. It's just like developing a photo. You just, when you did, whatever is exposed to the electron beam, it gets hardened or it can get even melted out. It depends on whether what you're using, the liquid here, whether it's positive or negative. So you can get, if at all, when you put it in a liquid, you know, this is a liquid flow, all of this can melt out, in which you get this kind of a mask, or it can get hardened, in which case all of the other things will melt out. And that is a negative mask. Now on top of this, you deposit a thin film, okay, and just lift it off, then this is exactly what you're doing. You know, here you're depositing a thin film of paint and then you're lifting out this stencil mask. And what remains is this. So instead of this nice uh, drawing here, imagine this, okay? This is a mask and you deposit a thin film here and you lift this out and you get whatever electrodes you want. So here are some of my own devices which I've shown you. This is a silicon wafer and there is a small little graphene here on which I wanted to do, do wires. These golden lines here, they're all wires actually. And it is done exactly by this process of called EV lithography, okay? And the equipment that does it look does all of this, it looks like this. This is called a scanning electron microscope. And you have to really control it through computers and because you're playing with electron beams, not just your hand and the paint, right? So it needs more care and control. So now you have already learned how devices are made, correct? So now once you've done, made these devices, how do you know their properties? And whether, you know, let's come back to the old question of 
ones and zeros and a light bulb. Now these are your devices or this here is a transistor basically. This is how you make a transistor into very thin scales. And then how do you know the properties? There is a system called a, all of these devices in a physics laboratory, typically uh, they work at very low temperatures, which is not just room temperature, but much, much like a th hundred times lesser than room temperature, or even low, thousand times low, lesser. So you have to really cool down. And to cool down these devices, there is something called a cryostat or a dilution fridge, like a fridge. How do you cool down something? You put it in a fridge. So now I need to need a fridge where I can actually pass wires and put a device and draw out wires from them and make some, pass some current and see if the light bulb goes on or off and things like that, for which the equipment is called a cryogenic cryostat or a dilution fridge and so on. And it looks like this from outside. This is a cryostat by IBM who manufactures so much of microprocessors, computers and all of it. And inside this thing is this, you know, this thing. So you can see there are so many wires going down. So all the way from room temperature, the wires go all the way down. And somewhere here will be the device which I have made here, this device. This device will sit somewhere here where it is going to be really, really cold at low temperature. And I can pass electric current and see, measure the signal and see whether I have a transistor the way it works or not, okay? And then once this is all tested in a laboratory level experiment, which is at low temperatures, a job of an experimental condensate physicist is nearly done because we have demonstrated that, look, I have made a device which looks like this and it behaves uh, like this. The, the light bulbs go on and off this in this manner. So you can use it. And from this stage, the industrial technology takes over and they try to make the whole device work at room temperatures because all of our uh, phones work at room temperature, right? They, you don't keep them inside a fridge to make them work. So, uh, and then the whole industry level technological uh, aspects take care of it to make it work. So where are we heading doing all of this? So this is how life of a condensed matter experimental physicist goes every day making devices, making new materials, measuring them at low temperatures. And this is usually the lifestyle. And now where are we headed? And why are we doing all these things? Okay. So the broad areas which, uh, which have really bright future are uh, the two. One is called the spintronics. I told you one thing. I told you that um, whenever you want to make a logical operation or tell something, tell the computer something, you have to tell it in terms of zeros and one, right? When the light bulb glows, that is when the current passes, then it's one. When it doesn't pass or the light bulb is off, it is zero. So here there is a problem. The problem is there's only zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, right? I don't have anything else. So electrons are the ones that actually give the current, okay? And these electrons have an additional property, which is called its spin, okay? It can either point up or down like this green arrow. So instead of zero and one, there is an additional handle called up and down, okay? So now what you can do is you can not only use the electron, the current property of the electrons, you know, the charge flowing, but you can also use this property of up and down of the electrons. And this whole subject of using uh, the up down property of electrons is called spintronics because this up and down inherent property of electrons is called a spin, okay? So it's called spin tonics. Now, what is the advantage? The advantage is you have zero and one through the current. Additionally, you also have the spin of the electron, which can also give you an extra handle, zero and one, zero and one. So instead of storing just with the current, you can also store information using up down property. So it, what, what, does, what does it say? It makes, the same processor hold much more information. So that's how you actually shrink the size, you know. In a smaller and smaller chip, you can have hold more information this time because spins are also coming into play and they're also helping. This whole subject is called spintronics and a lot of advancement has happened in this subject. 
And there is another thing which is called quantum computing. What is this all about? You know, you might have actually heard it in newspapers, random videos. What is this quantum computing all about? So what I told you, zero and one, these are called bits, right? So the the key thing here is you can always stay either zero or one. There is nothing in between. There is no half. There is no one fourth. There is no three fourth. Either zero or one. What quantum computation or qubit, okay? What quantum computing this whole field allows is not only one and zero, but you can also have a combination of one and zero. Okay, they write it in this funny way, but does it matter? Not only do one and zero, but there is some probability in which there is zero and there is some prob probability in which there is one. So this combination of ones and zeros are also allowed by quantum computing. So now the same electron becomes really infinitely powerful because not only one and zero, but several combinations of ones and zeros are also allowed. That makes a processor perform calculations really, really fast, very fast. If it, this is, this does in some speed, but thousand times faster uh, a, a quantum processor can uh, perform its computation. So these are roughly two ways. There are many ways in which condensed matter experiments are progressing, but very roughly these are two ways in which uh, future problems or technological problems, and even for fundamental physics, a point of view. There are a lot of open problems unsolved. So in summary, I have told you how materials are made thinner. How do you actually make the devices? How do you measure them? And then what are the, why are we doing this? And what are the future aspects uh, that can be looked at? And let me tell you, it's really uh, bright the future. And uh, uh, if so far, um, only few extremely sophisticated labs have been able to make quantum processes. But if you can make one, you're going to win a Nobel Prize right away, you know, if, if you make one in your kitchen, like for example, the way graphene was made. So uh, there are a lot of open problems and very less people. So definitely there's a lot of opportunities. And let me tell you one quick uh, thing on uh, who does this in India? Okay, a lot of institutes in India. You can Google search and find out. For example, TFR, where uh, I belong, uh, TFR is in Mumbai and Hyderabad, both and several other places. But experimental condensed matter physics is in Mumbai and Hyderabad. There is Indian Institute of Science. A lot of ICERs, IITs, NICER. There is of course BITS, where I did my PhD. So all these institutes, you can just go into the web pages and see what people are doing. And given that now you are in a high school um, and 11th, 12th uh, stage, the way people usually pursue these subjects, or even including me, is you do a BSc program and then an MSc, then a PhD, then a postdoc where I am, and then a faculty, and then I don't know what. But yeah, this is how people do. And you can also do a BTEC and pursue this line. So these are the ways in which. Uh, uh, people end up doing science. Uh, definitely, it's interesting. And there are some, for example, if you want to know more and you know what exactly is happening today and how are people really doing, I will state really very, uh, you know, some of the very important people in our country, uh, Vijay Raghavan, Mandar, these are all forefront researchers of India, but uh, uh, I cannot fill my slides with. The thousands of other amazing scientists in India, uh, but do go uh, to this, uh, the institutes which I mentioned previously, check out the website, see what interests you and explore what, what, uh, what you would like to uh, do. And usually, let me tell you, uh, we uh, usually think scientists are some, you know, very serious people who don't like to talk. It's not the case. Scientists always welcome questions and do not hesitate to get in touch with anybody if you think uh, that's what interests you the most. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. And I really vote uh, for basic sciences. Uh, we cannot pursue that. Uh, now I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thavala. It's been a, it was a very interesting talk. And uh, there are some questions that are coming up. Can you see the chat box on Zoom?
uh, if you could answer that, then I will relay the questions that are asked on YouTube. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so I will, I think the first uh, question is, do quantum computers already exist? So quantum computers don't exist. So first we have to understand what's a quantum computer. It's not like, you know, your laptop is going to get replaced one fine day called a quantum, you know, the computer you are using is going to be called a quantum computer. Not really. It's just that the processors inside, you know, the functioning of this, uh, the, the processors are going to function in a very different logic, which is uh, like I told you, not just zeros and ones, but a combination of zeros and ones. So uh, that's what is going to happen when things succeed. And there are quantum processors which are built by IBM, Google, uh, there is something called, uh, I mean, you can search for quantum supremacy and things like that, where all these forefront companies are trying to make quantum processors really uh, available. So we are still not there as a user, end, but definitely a lot of research is being uh, going on. And there are definitely working quantum processors in uh, forefront labs. Uh, and I think not yet in India. Or there is, I showed you Professor Vijay Raghavan's lab. He is the one who's really doing amazing stuff there. So he might have a better answer for this. Well, uh, next is what is quantum mechanics? Uh, what is quantum mechanics? Okay. So uh, the physics of classical objects or, uh, or macroscopic objects is governed by certain rules and uh, laws, which is accessible to us. And we can see these. Uh, in a very approachable and understandable way. But what happens when you make these materials really small and small? The thing that changes is instead of, you know, 10 power, like huge number of atoms, you're going down to atomic scales where you can count the number of atoms, essentially. And the properties of these things change drastically. And the physics that basically works at this scales of, uh, of that dimensions is very different. And quantum mechanics is a subject that tells you how uh, things behave at this uh, low dimensions or low temperatures and at really small levels. How does an atom behave? How does an electron behave? So uh, quantum mechanics is a subject that addresses uh, these things. Uh, it's not a complete answer for sure, uh, but it is uh, a rough, roughly, it, it is what it is. Now, this next one is how do we code in spintronics? Okay, uh, so how do we code in spintronics? Now, spintronics is again, uh, as I told you, instead of zeros and ones of uh, the electronic charge, you have spin up and spin down, right? So, spin up and spin down is also in zero and one. So if you have a spintronics-based gadgets, which there are prototypes, then the coding doesn't change. It's zero and one again. It's still classical. I mean, classical in the sense that it is not quantum. That's all. There is still two states up and down. That's it. I mean, nothing different about it. Uh, what hurdles do researchers face in developing quantum computers? OK, this is an amazing question, because researchers face only hurdles. There's nothing, uh, very rarely are there moments of enlightenment in quantum computer. We are in a very, very primitive stage, far away from realizing a quantum computer. If you can make one, it will be great. Um, as I told you, there are different uh, aspects, material synthesis, and then coming up with uh, making devices, and then cooling down to low temperatures. And then even the materials, how efficient are they? There are so much. And once you have a processor, what language are you going to use? Because the whole logic or the language in which the language which computers understand these days, it's classical, it's based on zeros and ones. Now, when you go to the quantum computing regime, the logic is not zero and one anymore. It's, it's completely different. So people have to even develop the algorithms using this logic. So challenges are plenty to be short. Next, uh, what computer? I think I have answered these questions. What makes quantum computers different from regular ones? Yeah. Uh, 
same thing i have answered that spintronics uses code up down yeah it's zero and one how do you get the inspiration no uh all right so it's so it's how do i get inspiration i am just interested in these subjects so uh, most of the people scientists who pursue not just me i would talk on behalf of a lot of people whom i know who do research they are simply interested in what they do uh, and that's how they are motivated there's nothing else no uh, you don't have to get inspiration when you really love what you do right so if you love basic science just pursue it next what changes will be made to mobiles like 4g 5g 3g i don't know we'll have to wait and see okay uh thavla there's one question which says um yeah. is quantum computing uh, inspired by or related to artificial intelligence very good okay yeah uh i don't know a very good answer to this question actually uh definitely artificial intelligence is something a very general uh, topic so i don't know so well uh, so let me not take that question uh, but i like this question here how is 1 plus 1 equal to 1 that's very good question so in this uh, in this you can still see my uh, screen no chandrika yes yes we can so here how is 1 plus 1 equal to 1 so the whole thing is don't think of one uh, when you say 1 plus 1 equal to 2 and so on you are in a very the number scale that you are living in is not a binary system in binary system only zero and one is allowed 1 plus 1 uh, equal to 1 simply means that if i have a glowing bulb here if the bulb glows it is one if it doesn't glow it is zero so if i have a glowing bulb here and a glowing bulb here the bulb is going to glow it end of the story so that's how it is one so uh yeah that's how 1 plus 1 is equal to 1 now uh, sorry uh, what are the downsides of quantum computers compared to conventional computing systems as now if let us say you know by magic you give me a quantum computer and it does all that we dream of there is no downside yet but we really need to see one thing right now is that the quantum processors that work okay by ibm or google they look magnificently huge and they work only at like millikelvin temperatures okay very very like 1000 times less lower temperature than uh, than the room temperature to keep it that cool keep a device that cool there is huge amount of energy spent so uh, that is a definitely a downside in the sense just to run a quantum computer you are spending so much energy you know as compared to a classical computer where you just turn on the laptop and it works right but for quantum processors you have to keep it running you need to cool it and that takes exot uh, exorbitantly high uh, energy uh, okay uh can we preserve cryogenic body in cryogenic state for 100 years maybe depends on the temperature that's the answer what makes uh, quantum computer different from regular computer as i have answered yeah some people have answered the questions here what is the future innovation of quantum technology yeah um, i have spoken about it extensively you can i mean making the quantum processor itself how do you get the idea to research uh, how do you get the idea it's a good question usually you pursue problems and this is something which comes by by experience so when you, there is a lot of research that's happening around the world and these are usually published in various journals and when you read these journals you know what people have done and you also know what they have not done so you get ideas based on what people have done and what is not addressed in the journals and that's how you pick up Uh, you try to fill the voids initially, and then 
uh, you also try to come up with some completely out of the box questions to answer. So that's how uh, it's done. What is, is nanotechnology playing a role in quantum mechanics? Yes, definitely. Because all of this, what I told you, you know, the whole revolution going from microscopic, microscopic gadgets to uh, really small dimensions, that is nan nanotechnology or that means, you know, take your, take a human hair and it's million times smaller than the human uh, hair. That's how it is. Uh, where am I? Okay. What are the benefits of quantum computing? I have discussed it extensively. Uh, when cryogenic measurements unit came, it's not a, okay. The question is when did cryogenic measurement unit come into existence. It's not a unit, okay? Cryogenic simply means, cryo means cold, going colder and colder. What happens is when you pass current through a wire, it gets heated up just because there is, you know, resistance in the wire. It's not super smooth that there is no. When you heat it up, there's electrons inside the wire colliding with the atoms and that generates all the heat. Now, you if the heat or the energy of this heat is higher than the signal that you want to see, then your signal gets very lost, okay? So for example, if you're traveling, how will I explain this? If you're going through a crowded street and you are just not let to move further, okay, and then uh, you just don't end up on the other side. So uh, to really have a smooth uh, uh, measurement of any signal when you pass currents, it's important that all the heat, unnecessary heat, is not there. For which you have to cool down the system. You have to cool it down really low for this reason. And one means liquid nitrogen, which you might have heard of. Okay, When you go down to about 70 Kelvin, the nitrogen in the air condenses and forms a liquid. So you, liquid nitrogen is always in 78 uh, Kelvin. So one thing is to take your device and dip it in liquid nitrogen. It becomes that cold. You can go further down. You can condense helium in a very similar fashion. And that gives you about 4 to 2 Kelvin, 4 to 3 Kelvin temperature. And there are more ways in which, specialized way in which you can do this uh, kind of physics further and cool it down to milli Kelvin temperatures. So this, when did it come into existence? It's been about 50, 60 years. That's how, that's, that's how old it is. 1930s, I may be wrong about the pre pre precise number, but it's all the 1910 to 1950, something of that order. What are the recent trends in quantum physics? The recent trends are plenty. Uh, what I described to you is one, okay? And there are numerous ways in which you can progress. You will know these things if you kind of go into an institute, look at the physics department, see what people work on. That's how you will know what are the various ways. Why is MIT special? Okay, it's the world number one institute because it is, and uh, there have been 50, 60 Nobel laureates from the same institute. It's really old. So there are many things why it is special. Now, is quantum computing a good choice for digital era? It is good or bad, and we'll have to see once it works, okay? Uh, uh, what is quantum mechanics again? So I think I told you an answer. Which sensor is used in our mobile phones? Uh, which is the sensor? I really don't know the name of the sensor. Uh, for sound, it should be a simple solenoid magnet, but I don't know. Uh, okay. What are the recent trends? Is quantum computing difficult? Okay. Is when something is difficult, it's only these two things. Either it is when it's easy when you know it, okay. And when it's really advanced, uh, only then it becomes difficult. So you have to sort of reach that advanced level by, uh, for example, you cannot go on day one and, uh, you know, jump 
uh, do a high jump of 20 meters, right? You cannot do it. Nobody can do, I guess. But even five meters, you cannot do it on day one because it's advanced. Your body is still not ready. So similarly, you have to practice, practice. You have to go through all the stages, various stages of difficulty, and one day you will crack it when you know it. So it's either more advanced or less advanced. There is nothing called really difficult. Uh, that's why for me, quantum computing may be super difficult because I don't know many things which are required to answer a certain question. Whereas for someone else, it must be super easy because they know all the basics. So it's just that. Um, okay. What is the fastest quantum computer in the world? I, uh, this is the fastest, I don't know. What is the, it could be the IBM or the Google. They are the only two people who are actually making quantum processors. So one of the two. Is it reliable? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, is there a screen? No, uh, there is no screen. I mean, it's about the processors, as I told you. Uh, what is meant by molecular beam epitaxy? Okay. Uh, so let me go back to this question here. Yeah. So molecular beam epitaxy, as the name says, molecular beam epitaxy. Epitaxy means, you know, small monolayer by layer. So it's a system, it's a chamber where you evaporate materials in a very controlled way that the atoms of this material starts evaporating and they start getting deposited on the system. And you do this whole thing in a very ultra high vacuum chamber, then that is that whole thing is called molecular beam epitaxy. Okay. Uh, advantages of quantum computer. I told you that that it, you can um, do things much more quickly. And, uh, it allows you a larger space that because it allows you superpositions of zeros and ones. Uh, there is a question which says, when do we learn these concepts in school? Do they learn this in uh, 12th standard or much later? Uh, quantum mechanics is something people learn in BSE or uh, if you... For example, uh, in BSc, definitely you will learn uh, quantum mechanics, fundamentals of quantum mechanics and how things behave when you go uh, to really small dimensions. If you do engineering and then if there are uh, uh, specialized physics courses, even then you would learn. Uh, but as far as my knowledge goes, quantum mechanics is not something which... Uh, is really addressed at a school or you know up to 12 standard not really uh, there's another question from prithvi coding school uh, it says is there a difference between the supercomputer and a quantum computer yeah i mean supercomputer is not a quantum computer quantum you know supercomputers really mean you know high end technology to do things faster and multi core and uh, processing speeds, it's about that. Whereas quantum computer is something, I shouldn't say quantum computer as such, I mean quantum processes. The fundamental logic in which they work is completely different. So that's the difference. Whereas a supercomputer would mean, I mean, the logic is still 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay, it's classical. Yeah. So, yeah, actually my message is, this box is uh, moving so quickly that I'm, I might be skipping uh, Question. Yes, yes. And hence, I'm trying to filter out uh, some yeah, questions. Sure, but, uh, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, of course, there are several questions that are being repeated. So children, uh, I request you to pay attention to the answers being given by uh, Dr. Yes. Suri so that uh, you ask uh, your own unique questions and uh, uh, the interaction is uh, much more fulfilling. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think we have a huge array of questions. And uh, if there are no more new questions, uh, maybe we'll wait for a minute uh, and then we all can thank Dr. Suri for her wonderful talk and uh, 
uh, Dhala, you could also, I think my voice yeah. went off for a minute. Yeah, you could yeah. also go through the questions and see if you find something interesting to answer. Yeah, sure. So there is a question here which says, why are there a lot of equipment for quantum computer and they are larger? That's a, a very good observation, in fact. Uh, when I showed you, I mean, quantum processor, you know, the processor is really small, or the way it looks. Uh, for example, uh, you know what Vijay is holding here in his hand? It's a chip where there is, a, per, I do not know, I, I, I do not have a first-hand information of what is inside it. But uh, quantum chip or a processor with a substrate holder, with a holder would look as big as this, you know, not really so huge. But then the temperatures at which they work right now is really cold, you really, really like thousand times smaller than the room temperature. That's why it looks like, you know, the quantum computer is big. No, this is not a computer. This is a processor. The processor is really small. But to make it work, you have to cool it down to such low temperatures. And this is a fridge. This is just a fridge. The fridge at your home uh, lowers the temperature by two to three Kelvin, but this fellow actually lowers the temperature by thousand Kelvin or so. So that's why you might have got confused that uh, the equipment is large. But you're, it's, it's right, it's huge, but it's for this reason. Uh, yeah. Do these concepts in higher education? Yeah, if you crack JE advance and so on, if you join an IIT, surely you are going to lose, you will have people delivering courses on quantum computation, uh, uh, definitely. Uh, there's one question which says, does quantum physics have any applications in biology? Sudharani asks this question. There should be, I mean, quantum, uh, I mean, see, quantum mechanics is something, quantum physics is something you can, it, it tells you what happens when things go really small in size. And of course, I, I am not uh, uh, the right person to answer this because I'm not a biologist. Uh, I do not have much knowledge in this field, but uh, definitely biology has uh, things. Definitely there are a lot of applications. Uh, biophysicists, for example, uh, there is uh, the cells or any of these, these are really small in size. and. Uh, the dynamics of these objects can be actually uh, addressed, uh, modeled using uh, quantum mechanics for sure. Uh, what exactly? What exactly are you looking at? Is what matters. Right? Uh, the scientists do look at it. A uh, lot of doing biology, so they will be the right people to answer. Uh, but in short, yeah, sure, uh, there are applications of quantum mechanics to biology. Um, yes, so we can take maybe two more questions and close the session. Uh, so if I can filter them out. Yes, um, uh, I think I lost them. Yes, uh, so Pr the Prithvi's coding school asks, what is the clock speed of quantum computers? And the second question by mm -hmm. Bhanupriya is, uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned about the foldable mobile phones in the future. Yeah. What do you think the screen material uh, would be for such phones. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, a uh, clock speed of a quantum computer. I do not remember the number of hand, but uh, you should be definitely able to uh, find uh, the processing speeds. Um, one is clock speed, but when it comes to quantum processors, it's about uh, what is right now, what is really uh, important or uh, looked at is if you give a certain problem to the quantum processor, how much time does it take to solve the problems? Okay, that depends on how many number of qubits or how many number of these quantum qubits, the superpositions of zeros and ones you have in the system. So there is no one answer to this question. In fact, um, it depends on how many qubits are there. Uh, initially, IBM had eight qubits and then 54 and I mean, the number of qubits is increasing. As the number of qubits increase, the uh, speed of uh, solving these problems will, uh, will be better. So it's not like uh, your laptops where there is a so many gigahertz clock speed defined. No, that's not the way it works. Uh, second, uh, foldable mobile phones. Yeah, so this is an interesting question. Uh, Samsung, I believe, has... Uh, 
has demonstrated a flexible phone or something where the screen was made out of graphene. So graphene is a wonder material which could, in principle, uh, be a material for those things. Yeah. So do you have any other questions? Okay. Uh, maybe the last question to close the session uh, comes from Deepika uh, from mm -hmm. Kokat School and she asks, uh, is it possible that there will be attacks in quantum cryptography? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's possible. It's, uh, it's supposed to be really robust and, you know, much better than classical ones. But definitely, uh, it's possible to have a uh, hack it too. Uh, it's not uh, it's not completely foolproof yet, yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, thank you everybody, all the 100 participants who are there on Zoom, including students and teachers of all the 16 uh, uh, T-Sweary schools, and all those who are also joined us on YouTube. Um, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, thank you, Dr. Suri, for your wonderful uh, lecture and introduction today. Thank you, thank you very much.